Again, I'd like to say good evening and welcome to my beloved brethren, friends and family of Shiloh Springfield Seventh-day Adventist Church, as well as those of you who are joining us online for this third night, this third study in our week of prayer, where we're looking at the subject, how does the gospel prepare us for the second coming of Jesus? During our last study, uh, we answered the question, why Seventh-day Adventists? Of all the denominations that exist today, in confusion upon this one book, the Word of God, why are we Seventh-day Adventists today? And we were able to see that in our name is our mission. In our name is our mission. The name Seventh-day Adventist, beloved, we saw, means that when God finishes His work of completely sanctifying a people, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in His people, when that is accomplished, then the advent, the second coming of Jesus, will take place. And so we saw that Seventh-day Adventism is a movement designed not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord. Amen? What a wonderful study we had the, uh, the other day, beloved, yesterday night. And now I'm asking you to be prepared again. I'm asking you, beloved, to have your sword in hand. I'm asking you to come with the correct mindset. I'm asking you to bow your head with me as we address and ask for the qualified teacher being the Holy Spirit before we move into this lesson today. Because answering the question, why Seventh-day Adventist, beloved, is a twin to what we're going to study tonight. Oh yes, beloved, on your screen you'll see that the message for tonight is entitled, How the Gospel Prepares Us, Our Prophetic Birth Date. Our prophetic what, beloved? Birth date. Did you know that Seventh-day Adventism has a prophetic birth date? That Seventh-day Adventism came in right on time, according to the great clock of time. Beloved, we're going to see this thing today. Uh, but before we move forward, bow your heads with me. Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for your love and your mercy towards us. Father, as we seek to understand even more of the identity you have given to us, as we seek today, Father, to understand even more our prophetic birth date, Father, I ask that you will take us by the hand and lead us, dear God, through safe pastures. Lord, unfold to us the more sure word of prophecy that we may stand upon the foundation that you have laid. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to address your people. I ask that you'll be with their minds, be with my mind. Hide me in the cleft of the rock, O Lord, that Christ alone may be seen and that you alone, O Father, may be heard this evening is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Beloved, what a wonderful study we have for tonight. We don't want to waste any time. We want to jump right into this thing. All right. We have 2,300 years of history to cover tonight. 2,300 years of history to be covered tonight. And by the grace of God, uh, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we're going to accomplish this thing, all right? Let's go on our Bibles. The first thing we want to accomplish, the first thing we want to see from the Word of God is the significance of the vision that God has given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What is the significance of the vision? Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 29. We're going in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 29 to get the answer to the question, what is the significance of the vision? In the book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, the Bible says, Where there is no what? Vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Beloved, the Bible says where there is no vision, the people do what? Perish. It is impossible, beloved, for this movement to receive revival. What does the word revival mean? What does it imply? The word revive means to bring to life again. It means to restore life. Now, any movement that needs revival, that needs to be given life again, has died. Isn't that so? Our spiritual experience today is that we are dead in our sins and our trespasses, but we have a faithful high priest we're going to see today, beloved. We have a faithful high priest in the man Christ Jesus who is seeking to cleanse us, seeking to remove that condition of deadness in sin and to revive us with the word of his gospel. Now, we're told here in the Bible that where there is no vision, the people do what? perish. So in order to revive us, beloved, in order to give us life again, God must restore to this movement the vision that gave it life in the first place. Does it make sense? 
If you want to revive something, simply give what gave life to it in the first place. If you want to reform something, simply understand what formed us in the first place. Does it make sense? Now, the Bible said that where there is no vision, the people perished. What vision has God given to this movement, beloved? On our screen. In the book, Great Controversy, page 409, and paragraph 1, we are told, The scripture, which above all others, had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent faith, was the declaration unto 2,000. And 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. She says, these had been familiar words to all believers in the Lord's soon coming. Beloved, are you a believer in the Lord's soon coming today? Are these familiar words to you? Could you explain the prophecy? Beloved, if you could not, by the grace of God, this study is intended to put it in your uh, view in such a way that you will be able to understand and to share the foundation and central pillar of the Adventist faith with others. Beloved, we need to understand this thing today. You're not an Adventist, beloved, if you don't understand this prophecy. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The 10th day of the seventh month, the day of atonement. If you don't understand the language that I'm speaking to you now, beloved, then your Adventism is not Adventism at its peak. It's not Adventism at all. Because you see, we're talking about our prophetic birth date. Adventism was born in a specific place in heaven. You didn't hear what I said, beloved. I said Adventism was born in a specific place in heaven, and it is only a people that understand that that can finish the work. What do I mean? When you read in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, about the loud cry angel, that fourth angel's message that brings the everlasting gospel, the Bible says, and I saw another angel come down from where? Heaven. Beloved, this angel symbolizes a movement of people who understand their birthplace. Not of this world, beloved, but somewhere in heaven. We're going to see as we go through this study. They come down from somewhere in heaven. Now that doesn't mean that they indulge in the earthliness that is in this world. No, no, no. They bring to this world from heaven a system of living that is heavenly, beloved. When you read in the book Adventist Home about how the Adventist family is supposed to be a little heaven on earth, beloved, you will understand what I am saying. But in order for you to have an Adventist home, that home has to have its origin in the place the Adventist movement was born. Follow along, beloved. Let me tell you something. I get excited every time I share this message. Father, I ask that you will be with the technology as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Everywhere that I go, that I have shared the 2300 day prophecy that we have studied into the prophetic birth date, of, birth date of this movement. Everywhere that I've shared this, beloved, there has always been something to try and shut it down. I remember one time I was preaching at a church in Brooklyn, and as we were sharing the message and going through the 2300 day prophecy, literally all of the technology went out. The lights turned off, the PowerPoint wouldn't work, the camera wouldn't work. And I said, Lord, that's fine, because inspiration says every earthly support will be what? Cut off. Let me tell you something. Every earthly support being cut off does not cut off the support of this ministry by the grace of God. My support is in heaven, in the very place where Adventism was born. The Adventist movement support is not earthly. It is from heavenly places, even the most holy place where our faithful high priest is, beloved. We need to get into that experience. We need to get back into that place. If you have lost that experience, I'm thankful the Bible says you can be born again. That is why we are looking at our prophetic birth date today this evening, beloved. That is why we're going to look at this thing even further. She says, these had been familiar words to all believers in the Lord's soon coming. By the lips of thousands was this prophecy repeated as the watchword. The what? The watchword of their faith. Beloved, if we claim to be watchmen in our generation, then we need to know the watchword of our faith. And he said unto me, unto 2,000, 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And not simply to know what the Bible says, but to know what the Bible meant by saying those words. What do you say? Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 8, and we're going to begin at verse 13. In the book of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13, we're going to begin to study the prophetic birth date of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. 
The Bible says in Daniel chapter 8, beginning at verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long? What was the question, beloved? How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Beloved, this text right here, before we go to verse 14, I need us to understand the backdrop of what's happening here. Uh, Daniel is in vision and he is watching Jesus, described as that certain saint, speaking with Gabriel, described as the other saint. Gabriel and Christ are having a discussion. And what is the question on Gabriel's heart? What does Gabriel and all of the heavenly intelligences seek to know at this time? The question was, how long shall the vision be? concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. How long does this great controversy have to go on from this point? How long does the trotting of the sanctuary have to take place? How long, Lord? Verse 14, beloved, Jesus gives the response, but notice who he gives the response to. Jesus does not turn and say anything to Gabriel specifically. Did, did Jesus hear the question? Yes, he did. Did Jesus ignore the question? No, he did not. But he turned and gave the answer of the question to the only beings in the universe who could bring its fruition to the forefront. In verse 14, the Bible says, and he said unto me, who did Jesus speak to? He said unto me, that is Daniel, beloved, representing humanity, representing you and I. The angels asked the question, and Jesus gave the answer, not to angels, but to humanity. Can you see that? It says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 2,300 days then, not a moment before. 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Beloved, are we following? Now there are a few things that I need you to write down. I want you to write 2,300 days. I want you to write then, I want you to write the sanctuary, and I want you to write be cleansed. The reason why I want you to write these four things is because when you understand the 2300 days, you understand that after 2300 days, there's something that is expected to happen. You wrote the word then because the word then implies that you should be expecting it. If you get the 2300 days correct, then you know at the end of that thing, something is to occur. Amen? You wrote the word sanctuary because we need to understand biblically which sanctuary is being referred to here. And you wrote the words be cleansed because at the end of the 2300 days, that is the experience that God's people ought to be receiving, the cleansing of sin. Now on your screen, you'll see a chart representing 2300 days or 2300 literal years. Beloved, let's get some Bible for our feet. We want to be sure as we're moving forward into this thing that this is not a private interpretation, that these things are going here a little, there a little, based upon the Word of God. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for how long? Forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. The Bible says that these 40 days symbolize 40 years. Each day in Bible prophecy represents one year. Can you see that? So when we're talking about 40 days, we're talking about 40 literal years. Let's get another example. In the book of Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, the Bible says, After the number of the days in which you search the land, even how long? 40 days each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years and you shall know my breach of promise. Beloved, the principle is sure. When we're looking at a day in Bible prophecy, we're looking at a literal year. Is that clear? We're looking at a literal year. So the 2300 days spoken of in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 symbolize 2300 literal years years. Now that's just the beginning of the understanding of this prophecy, beloved, because certainly you must know that in order to get the correct end point, in order to understand where the end of the 2300 days is, you must first identify where it begins. 
Now on your screen, you'll see a couple of dates here that I've written down. 457 BC, which is the start of the prophecy, and we'll validate that in a moment. 408 BC, 27 AD, 31 AD, 34 AD, and at long last, there is a very uh, special date at the very end. I didn't put it there because we're going to come there based upon the Word of God. I want you to see, beloved, that where Seventh-day Adventism comes in was prophetically ordained by God. You have a prophetic right to be here, and that being the case, you have a prophetic mission, a responsibility that has to be accomplished, beloved. It is a mission that God has given to this movement that no one but this movement can fulfill. Now, is it because this movement is special and everybody else is not as special as us? No, beloved. God is no respecter of persons. But the fact of the matter is that God has given this movement a message. By faith, we have followed Christ into a specific place, and because we have done that, we are the dispositories of His law. We are the dispositories of the everlasting gospel, the first, the second, the third, the fourth angel's message that comes down out of that most holy place. Beloved, unless we follow Christ by faith, it is impossible for us to be the movement who can accomplish this work. And that is all that I'm saying here. That is all that I'm saying here, because remember, I told you in our last message, if we are Adventists in name alone, and we are refusing to experience what the first, second, third, and fourth angel bring to us, if we do not experience the message that we preach, then beloved, we're not Adventists at all. I'm speaking specifically today to the Seventh-day Adventist born in the most holy place. And if you are a Seventh-day Adventist who has not experienced that, then it is time to be reborn. It is time to be born again of the water and of the Spirit by the grace of God. Can you hear me? All right. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 20. We want to get the, the, the beginning points of this prophecy so that as we're moving through it, it is seamless and it is clear and easy to understand. In the book of Daniel... Chapter 9, beginning at verse 20. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly how? Swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. What did Gabriel come to give Daniel, beloved? Skill and understanding. If we're lacking those things in regard to this prophecy, then Gabriel has come to us today by the grace of God. The angels are by our side to give us skill and understanding. The Bible says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art, what, greatly beloved. Therefore, because you are greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. The Bible says that Daniel was given the understanding of this prophecy because he was greatly beloved. Beloved, prophecy is an evidence of the love of God concerning his people. The Bible says, surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Do you remember before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus said concerning Abraham, shall I hide this thing from my friend Abraham? Beloved, God reveals these things to us because he loves us. And so don't be afraid of prophecy, beloved. Trust me, if you're studying Daniel and Revelation and you see more beasts than you see Jesus, you need to look at the prophecy again. The revelation is the revelation not of beasts, it is the revelation of Jesus. And so Jesus is to occupy the entire horizon of our vision as we move through this prophecy. We're going to see that God is giving us this understanding. God is giving us this skill because we are greatly beloved. Beloved, whether you're Adventist or not today and you're hearing the sound of my voice, hearing this message right now, I want you to know that you are greatly beloved. We're not here by happenstance, all right? It's, it's, not, it's not coincidence. This is divine providence. It is a divine appointment that you may understand your prophetic birth date. The Bible says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, 
understand the matter and consider this vision. The Bible says 70 weeks. What does the Bible say? 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. To do what? To anoint the most holy. The most holy is Christ. The most holy is the Messiah. It is saying that 70 weeks were given to the Jewish nation to receive Christ. 70 years. And so on your screen, you see that there's a period of 70 weeks that were given specifically to the Jewish nation. Now, beloved, how many days are in one literal week? How many days in a week? Seven days, correct? There are seven days in a week, Sunday all the way to the Sabbath, and then we start the cycle all over again. There are seven days in one week. But we know that each day in a prophetic week must symbolize one literal year. So there are seven years in one prophetic week. Are you following? Now, beloved, don't be afraid to use a calculator. I told you in our last study that you were going to need to understand some mathematics in order to get your birth date out of the Bible, in order to see this thing for yourself. Jesus is referred to as the wonderful numberer. So don't be afraid to use a calculator, all right? We see that there are seven literal years in one prophetic week because each day rep represents a year. Now, beloved, if you took that seven, uh, seven day period, that one week period, and multiplied it, by 70, you would be left with the number 490, 490 days in a 70 week period, but 490 days would be symbolic of 490 literal years. Do you see that? So back on the screen, the 70 week period specified in Daniel chapter nine, verses 20 through 24, that were determined upon the Jews was an actual 490 literal year period. A 490 literal year period, we're dealing with the Jewish nation, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 9. Now, the question is, where does this time period begin? Because it's the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. Where does it begin, beloved? The Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter 9, in verse 25, the Bible says, Know therefore, what does the Bible say? Know therefore, does the Bible say that you ought to guess at this thing? No, beloved, God has given us a more sure word of prophecy and we ought not to guess at anything. The Bible says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Beloved, the point here that I want us to get, the Bible said, know therefore and understand that from, or beginning, beloved, at the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Beloved, the Bible says that from the going forth of that commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that is the starting point of this 2300 day prophecy. That is the starting point of the 70 week period that was determined upon the Jews, Daniel's people. Now, biblically, do any of us know who gave that commandment? Does anybody know? The Bible says in the book of Ezra chapter six and verse 14, that it wasn't simply one king that did it. Go there, Ezra chapter six and verse 14, the Bible says, and the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. And they built and they finished it. Seventh day Adventists were to finish the work, amen. They finished it according to what? The commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The Bible says that the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, which begins the 2300 day prophecy, was given by Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, these kings of Persia. Beloved, there were three decrees. Now I want you to think about this, beloved, because in the, in the book of Revelation, there are three angels' messages. 
Amen? That finished the work. There are three angels' messages. And if you're studious, you know that there were not only three decrees, but there were how many? Four decrees. Study Nehemiah, beloved. Just as in Revelation, there are not only three angels, but there is a fourth angel that comes to assist the third. There was a fourth decree given to assist the three decrees that were already given because God's people, rather than going back to Jerusalem, rather than rebuilding their own, had become comfortable in Babylonian captivity. Beloved, spiritually speaking, we are living in the same exact era right now, the same exact condition right now. Those things were written unto us for and samples upon whom the ends of the world are come. Beloved, we're living in the exact same condition. God has called us out of Babylon, out of confusion. He has called us into the marvelous light of the first, the second, the third, and the fourth angel's message. And many of us, because we don't like the way that the gospel says we ought to eat, because we don't like the way that the gospel says we ought to dress, because we don't like that the gospel changes us. We refuse to leave the Babylonian lifestyle, refuse to leave the Babylonian music, the Babylonian style of dress and eat and all of these various things because of those things. Beloved, let me tell you something. We're living in the generation where God is going to finish the work. God is raising up even now an army of youth. We're told that an army of youth, an army of youth, an army of youth, rightly trained, might furnish. They would finish the work, beloved. That is what we're looking for in this generation. In fact, I believe it is going on even now. I believe that all over the world, God is raising up young people. And let me tell you something. To my, to my older brothers and sisters, don't feel left out because we have a health message, amen? And those of us who renew our strength, we're young people too, beloved, let's go. Let us finish the work that Jesus has called us to do. Let me not get ahead of myself. On the screen, in 457 BC, that commandment by Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia, was given to rebuild Jerusalem. And so in 457 BC, we find the start of the 70 week period. We find the start of the 2300 day prophecy of Daniel 8 and verse 14. Now let's go back to verse 25. There's something that I wanted us to see there as well as uh, not just the starting point. There was something there that I wanted us to see in the book of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. The Bible says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, unto who? The Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Beloved, the Bible says that from 457 BC, when the commandment was given by Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes that the temple in Jerusalem ought to be rebuilt and restored from 457 BC unto the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, would be a time period of seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. Do you know what that means? That means that the birth of Christ in Bethlehem should never have caught the people of God by surprise in that day. I already told you, the Word of God says that God does nothing except He reveals His secret. It was not something that should have caught God's people by surprise. Think about it, beloved, because it's a repetitive theme. It is a repetitive theme throughout the Word of God that God wants to do something, God lets His people know, and for some reason, His people are caught off guard. Caught sleeping, the Bible says, while men slept. Beloved, are we sleeping today? Do you remember the disciples all throughout the closing scenes of Christ's life? Read in Desire of Ages. Read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read about it. You will see that Christ repeated himself over and over, repetition to deepen the impression upon them that he was about to be crucified, that before he could be king in glory, before he could be priest on high, he must first be the lamb slain. He told them, beloved, that he was going to be crucified. And yet when crucifixion night finally came, when the day of the crucifixion finally came, when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, all of the disciples were surprised. They scattered. The Bible says that the shepherd is struck and the sheep scattered. They scattered, beloved, because they were caught by surprise. Beloved, some of us are waiting for a national Sunday law. And some of us simply hear it in Revelation seminars. But when the Sunday law passes, do you know inspiration says that it's going to take the world as an overwhelming surprise? Will you be surprised, beloved? I promise you, beloved, 
understanding and being prepared is about more than simply knowing what the Bible says. It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to manifest in you the fruit of Christ's righteousness. It is about allowing God to actually prepare you and to prepare your families. Beloved, if the Sunday law means for us that we will not be able to buy or sell because we are faithful to the Lord, are you planning to be faithful? Because that would mean that planning to be faithful involves a, an entirely different economic style of living. You need to be able to live in a time where you are told by the world that you can't buy or sell. How are you going to provide food? This is why country living was given to God's people. This is why the understanding of the Adventist home and how we're to operate through canvassing, through medical missionary work, all of these things were given to us, beloved, to prepare us for that crisis. And yet many of us are getting ready to be surprised, even as the Jews were surprised at the birth of Christ, even as the disciples were surprised at the crucifixion of Christ, we are getting ready to be needlessly Surprise. But I, I thank the Lord that we're here spending our time studying this thing right now because the studying of this thing is to prepare us for that. Praise the Lord. It is to prepare us. If we know who we are, we know who we ought to be. And that is the purpose of understanding our prophetic birthday. Let's get back into this thing. The Bible told us that from the going forth of the commandment in 457 BC, there would be a time period of how much until Christ? Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And so on the screen, we see this time period of seven weeks, which is actually 49 literal years, seven days in a week. Each day symbolizes a year. Seven times seven is 49 days, which is 49 literal years. Praise the Lord. And the Bible says there would be a period of three score and two weeks. A score is 20. 20 times three is 60 plus the two would give us 62 weeks. And in the year 27 AD, we were to expect the coming of Messiah the Prince. Now, beloved, here on the screen, you see that after 49 years from the commandment given, in the year 408 BC, the temple is being restored. The commandment is being obeyed. But why did the Jews wait so long? It was because they were comfortable in Babylonian captivity. They were procrastinating on the very commandment God had given providentially to send them home. Now, I wonder if we're doing the same thing today. I wonder if God gave a message that he commanded to be given in all the world to bring about the end and to usher in the coming of Christ. And I wonder if we are procrastinating upon that thing and if that message has not yet gone forth to the entire world. In the year 27 AD, the Messiah came just as the Bible prophesied that he would. Now, does anybody know what the word Messiah means? The word Messiah means the anointed one. Remember we studied that name means mission. When you call Jesus the Lamb of God, he is to take away the sin of the world. When you call him Jesus, he is to save us from our sins. When you call him Emmanuel, he is God with us. And when you call him the Messiah, he is the anointed one. So we're dealing with the anointed one in this prophecy. Why? When was Jesus anointed, beloved? If you can locate in the earthly ministry of Christ when he was anointed, then you know when he began his mission of Messiah in relation to the 2300 day prophecy that was promised. When was Jesus uh, anointed? Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beloved. Go in your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 4. We want to see when Jesus was anointed, then we will know when he was the Messiah and we will understand what took place in the 2300 day prophecy, Luke chapter four and verse 18, the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath done what? Anointed me. Hold on, beloved. Jesus says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath done what? Anointed me. So wherever in the earthly ministry of Christ, you can find the spirit of God coming down upon him. It is there that Jesus's mission as Messiah, anointed one begins. Are we getting closer? Do we know when Jesus was anointed? Yes, we do. Go to verse one. Same chapter, beloved. Same chapter. The Bible says, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness. You remember the story, beloved. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and as he came out of the water, the heavens opened up, and the voice of the Father was heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and the Spirit of God, the anointing, the divine teacher, came down in the form of a dove, 
and rested upon now the Messiah, the anointed Prince Jesus Christ. Do you see that, beloved? So at the baptism of Jesus, Jesus became the anointed one, the Messiah, and in 27 AD, the mission of Christ as Messiah had begun. The mission of Christ as Messiah had begun. He was baptized, and now we're dealing with the Messiah. Is it clear? I pray that it's clear, beloved. Now, on the screen here, we see that we have accomplished how many weeks? 69 weeks, or 483 literal years of time. We have accomplished 483 years out of the 490 literal years that were given to the Jewish people. We have accomplished 69 weeks, but beloved, God did not give the Jewish nation 69 weeks, did he? No, beloved, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said in Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 24, that 70 weeks were determined upon that people. And so if we have only accomplished 69 weeks by the coming of Christ in baptism as the Messiah, then, beloved, how much time is left for the Jews? How much time is left for the Jewish nation out of that 70-week period? One week. One week is left, beloved. There is one week or seven literal years determined upon the Jewish people that are left out of the 70 weeks that were promised. Now, does anybody know how long the earthly ministry of Jesus actually lasted? The earthly ministry of Jesus, it is a historic fact, lasted for three and a half years. Now that's a historic fact, but it's also biblical fact, amen? We want biblical foundation. How do we know that the ministry of Christ on the earth lasted for three and a half years? How do we know that he was with his disciples for three and a half years until his crucifixion? The Bible says, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be what? Cut off. The Bible says, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be what? cut off, but not for himself. It was for us, beloved. It says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Verse 27, beloved, pay close attention. And he, speaking of Christ, he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? One week. Hold on, beloved. Are you catching this? We saw in the prophecy chart that 70 weeks were determined upon the Israelites, but from 457 BC unto 27 AD, 69 weeks were accomplished and one week was left. Now we're seeing in the Bible that he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? One week. Beloved, can you see that this is not a prophecy to guess at? The word of prophecy is more sure than an eyewitness. Can you see it, beloved? The Bible says, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week. When, beloved? In the middle of the week. Hold on there. How long, beloved? I need you, I need you to focus. I need you to, I need you to catch these points as we're moving through the prophecy. How many days are in one week? Seven. Seven days. But those seven days in Bible prophecy are symbolic of how many years? Seven literal years. Now, beloved, what is half of one week? Three and a half days. Beloved, are we hearing this? Three and a half days, which symbolize three and a half literal years. So if Christ was to be cut off, crucified, in the midst of the final week given to the Jews in the 70-week period, then it would be three and a half days. Three and a half literal years from his baptism in 27 AD when he became Messiah. Three and a half years until his crucifixion. Can you see that, beloved? Beloved, this is simple uh, Bible mathematics. This is Bible math. I bet you you didn't know that the Bible is a history book. The Bible is a math book. Beloved, the Bible is a science book. Yes, it is. The Bible teaches about the anatomy and physiology of the new creature in Jesus Christ. Beloved, the Bible says that when Jesus returns, we will behold him, and by beholding him, we will be changed, that this corruptible must put on incorruption. That th beloved, listen to me. This thing is a perfect, well-rounded textbook. There is not a thing in the world that you can't get from the Word of God. You get science there, 
You get history there, accurately, praise the Lord. You get mathematics, beloved. We need to delve into this thing even deeper. But now we're seeing here in verse 27 that Christ would confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of that week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to do what? Cease. Jesus caused the sacrifices to cease. No more slaying of lambs. Why? Because the Lamb of God was slain on that cross. No need to slay the type because the type had met the anti-type in Jesus. Do you see that, beloved? And so from 27 AD unto the year 31 AD, three and a half years later, we find the crucifixion of Jesus. The ministry of Christ on earth, three and a half years, ended with the crucifixion of Christ three and a half years after his baptism in the year 31 AD. Now you can see this on the chart in the book of Matthew chapter 27. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 27. I want you to see something here. In the book of Matthew chapter 27, the Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was what? Rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. Beloved, why was the curtain in the temple torn? Why did the hand of God tear the curtain in the temple in two? Why did he do that? It was a symbol, beloved, to the earthly sanctuary that this work here was completed. No need to sacrifice lambs anymore. Christ has accomplished that. Now we have to take our eyes from the earthly and shift them to Christ in the heavenly. No more earthly sanctuary, beloved. No more of that. No more feast days on the earth. Let me tell you something, beloved. It is impossible to believe in the feast days today and to be living in the day of atonement. Because the feast days never overlap. You can't celebrate the Passover on the Day of Atonement. Beloved, it's either Christ is in that most holy place or he is not. But you cannot hold to the earthly sanctuary and to the heavenly sanctuary. Beloved, there are two feasts left. Only two. We're living in the first of the two, and that is the Day of Atonement. And the second, at the end of the 6,000 years by the grace of God, is the Feast of tabernacles. For 1,000 years, the saints will help the Lord in heaven. For 1,000 years, they will be witnessing the judgment of Christ in heaven. And at the end of that 1,000 years, this controversy wraps up. Beloved, I don't want to go too much into that, but I want us to understand that because there's a lot of winds of doctrine blowing around today. And we need to understand as Seventh-day Adventists what this thing really is. When we're talking about the Day of Atonement, what are we actually saying about this thing? There are things that are, there are duties rather, that's what I'll say. Read in Leviticus chapter 16. There are duties of the congregation on the Day of Atonement. Beloved, we are to be afflicting our souls. We are to be putting sin away. Surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit entirely. It doesn't matter what part of our life it is. Jesus wants it all because he paid for it all. He gave his all, beloved, and he would have all of you if you would receive all of him. Going back to the screen now, we see that in 31 AD, Christ was crucified in the middle of that final week. Now, beloved, if Christ was crucified in the middle of that final week, how many days are left until the end of the 70 week period? There are three and a half years left. And that would bring us to the year 34 AD, the year in which Stephen was stoned and the gospel was forced out to the Gentiles. We were staying in Jerusalem. The Bible said that the apostles were to abide in Jerusalem until power came down. They received power. They preached in Jerusalem. And in 34 AD, at the end of the 70 week period with the stoning of Stephen, we were forced out of Jerusalem. And now the gospel went to every Gentile under the sun by the power of the Holy Spirit through those men. Beloved, the word of God is sure. Are you seeing this? Now we have studied carefully and we have seen 400 and 90 literal years accomplished from the 2300 day prophecy, 490 literal years. Beloved, we have covered 490 literal years, but my question is, did Daniel 8:14 say unto 490 literal years, then should the sanctuary be cleansed? Is that what the Bible says? No, it said 2,300. So out of the 2,300 literal years, if you were to subtract 490 from 2,300, what would it leave you with, beloved? How many years are left until the completion of this prophecy? We have 1,810 years. Now take that 1,000. 
810 years and add it to 34 AD, what year, beloved? What year do you find yourself in by the end of the 2300 days? You find yourself in the year 1844. 1844, beloved. Now hold on. Some of us may have been thinking up until this point that 1844 was a date that Sister Ellen White pulled out of a hat. How much of Sister White's writings were used to prove this thing just now? Not even one, beloved. Everything is founded upon the word of God. But what the prophet said is precisely what the Bible said at the end of 2000. 300 days beginning from 457 BC unto the coming of Messiah 27 AD. There would be a period of seven weeks and three score and two weeks. We find the Messiah what year? 27 AD. The Bible says that Jesus would be cut off in the midst of the final week three and a half years later in the year 31 AD. And on 34 AD, three and a half years after that, Stephen was stoned. The gospel moved from the Jews and went to the Gentiles. Praise the Lord, 1,810 years later, we find ourselves with a prophetic birth date. Beloved, 1844. We did this with the Bible and the Bible alone. Beloved, we have sure ground as a movement upon which to stand. Do you see that? Do you see it, beloved? Sure ground from Prince Jesus himself upon which we may stand, beloved. We have a prophetic right to be here. Now the question is, now that we've come to the year, we don't stop there, beloved. Now that we've come to the year 1844, my question is, what about it? What's special about the year? What did the Bible say would take place? The Bible said, unto 2000, 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? cleansed. The question now is what is the sanctuary? What is the sanctuary spoken about in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14? Beloved, this is the question that led to a great disappointment in the year 1844 uh, when this prophecy was being proclaimed. William Miller and those of the Millerite movement were under the impression that the earth was the sanctuary. Thus, when they saw this text and they saw that it ended in 1844, they came to the conclusion that Jesus must be coming to cleanse the earth. But is that biblical? Is that what the Bible teaches, that the earth is the sanctuary? Beloved, the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or more witnesses shall everything be established. Now, we have a couple of witnesses here with us. Yes, yes, from the word of God. We have a couple of witnesses to let us know what sanctuary is being spoken about, what sanctuary would be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days and 1844. What sanctuary? Our first witness goes by the name of Moses. And in the book of Exodus chapter 25, beginning at verse 8, he says, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I shall show thee after the pattern, the what? The pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Moses says that God had him build a sanctuary that was made after a pattern that was shown to Moses. So then the sanctuary that Moses made, the earthly sanctuary was made after a pattern. And anything that has a pattern, beloved, anything that has a blueprint has a great original. Is it clear? Let's keep on. The Apostle Paul, our second witness, says this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. He says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Beloved, what, is the, what does that word mean? What does it mean for something to be the sum? The sum is the summary of everything that we have said. You read the book of Romans? Paul wrote that. First and Second Corinthians, Paul wrote that. First and Second Thessalonians, Paul wrote that. Beloved, of everything he said, he says this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Where? In the heavens. Where, beloved? In the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary. Catch this. A minister of the sanctuary located where? In the heavens and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Beloved, did the Apostle Paul ever consult with Sister Ellen White about this issue? 
No, he did not. In fact, he lived thousands of years before Ellen White came on the scene. Isn't that so? Beloved, this gospel is so sure. The Apostle Paul says, of everything I said to you, the summary is this. This is all I was trying to say the entire time. We have a high priest. Yes, we do. His name is Jesus, and he is a minister of the sanctuary located where? In the heavens. When you're looking at Daniel 8 and verse 14, beloved, if you're looking upon the earth, I say we must look a little higher. Praise the Lord. We have to look a little higher because the sanctuary is not on the earth. The sanctuary, as the Apostle Paul says, as the, uh, as the prophet Daniel said, is after a pattern. The Apostle Paul says that pattern was after heavenly things. In fact, let us continue. He says, who serve unto the example and shadow of what? Heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So we're seeing now that the sanctuary that Moses built upon the earth was after a pattern of a heavenly sanctuary in which Christ ministers as our faithful high priest. Is it clear? Is it all Bible? Absolutely. Continuing, witness number three. We call him John the Beloved. Praise God. He wrote the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verses 10 through 13, John says this, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and being turned, the Bible says, I saw. Beloved, some of us don't trust Sister White. I don't recommend that. And I don't see why we don't trust her, beloved, because everything she says, the Bible says, but some of us don't trust her. My question to you now is, do you trust Moses? Do you trust the, the Apostle Paul? Do you trust John the Revelator? John says, irrespective of what any doubter may say, I saw something in heaven. He says, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Hmm, that sounds like the holy place, does it not? And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Beloved, where are the seven branch candlesticks located in the sanctuary? In the holy place. John turned and saw Jesus in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Continue with us. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11 and verse 19, the Bible says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven. Where, beloved? In heaven heaven and there was seen another eyewitness account there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament so what did john see in heaven beloved john saw jesus in the midst of the seven branch candlesticks so he saw the holy place ministration praise god that's what he saw he saw the holy place in the heavenly sanctuary but now we're seeing that john also saw in heaven the ark of god's covenant the ark of his testament where was that located in the earthly sanctuary it was in the most holy place so john saw both the holy place in heaven and the most holy place beloved can you see that our faith is founded upon the word of god can you see from the 2300 day prophecy that we have a prophetic birth date and in 1844 the movement showed up right on time now it is true it is historic fact that it wasn't until the year 1893 or rather 1863 that we as a movement took the name seventh day adventist but beloved can you see that prophecy determined that we would be born beloved prophecy determined that this movement would be born we have a reason to be here follow on in that Ark of the Testament, there was something special to be seen, and that is known as the Law of Liberty. We know that the Ten Commandments are found in the Ark of the Covenant. So everything about our movement, when we talk about the Sabbath that we keep, that came from the Ark of the Covenant, which is in the Most Holy Place, which is where Jesus moved October 22nd, 1844, to cleanse the sanctuary. Beloved, that is the Day of Atonement. Everything about our faith is founded upon this prophecy. And we have seen now from the word of God that it is sure ground for our feet. Beloved, do we understand it as we ought? If not, I pray that we pause 
or rather finish the video, uh, but go back again and reread, restudy through these things so that you can have it for yourself. Beloved, study and study and study until you cannot but share this thing with the world. Beloved, I had to study this thing and saturate myself and super saturate myself with the 2300 days until I could talk about this thing day and night. Let me tell you something, beloved. This is not my first go around by the grace of God. It will not be my last. The 2300 day, the prophetic birth date of God's people is something that has been lost to us as a people. There are many of us who cannot prove from the word of God where we come from, why we're here, and why we believe what we believe. Why do you dress the way that you dress? Because we're in the 10th day of the 7th month. Why do you eat the way that you eat? Because we're in the 10th day of the 7th month. Some of us have issues, beloved, because we don't understand this thing from the word of God for ourselves. And I'm thankful that the word of God is so clear. The word of God is so clear. Uh, there's a book written by Stephen Haskell. It is called The Cross and its shadow. Beloved, I encourage you, go and read that. If this message was not simple for you, that thing will simplify it for you. Go and read that book, beloved. There are so many resources left for us. Uh, there's a compilation book uh, for Sister White called Christ in His Sanctuary. Go and read that. A couple of uh, quotations from the, not, not quotations, but actual chapters in the Great Controversy deal with the judgment, deal with answering our life's record. Beloved, go and read, understand the message for this time. This is present truth. And unless we understand it for ourselves, we'll never be what God calls us to be in this generation. Now, I told you that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, Everything would be established, and I gave you the witness of Moses. I gave you the witness of the Apostle Paul. We got the witness of John the Revelator. Praise the Lord. But, beloved, there are four. There's one more. In fact, there are more than four, but I, we're going to take our time, and I'm going to give you four. One more uh, witness to testify to the fact that the sanctuary spoken of in the 2300 days was, in fact, the heavenly sanctuary. Witness number four goes by the name of King David. And in the book of Psalms, chapter 102, beginning at verse 18, David wrote these words. This shall be written for the generation to come. And I believe we are that generation. He says, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he, that is the Lord, he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Beloved, did King David consult with Sister Ellen White about this thing that he's talking about now? No, and yet David, thousands of years ago, knew that there was a sanctuary in heaven from which God looks down. Beloved, can you see that the sanctuary in heaven is not something that we pulled out of a hat. This is Bible, and anyone who believes in the faithful high priest, Jesus Christ, anyone who believes in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, anyone who believes in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, holds to that truth, that he is our faithful high priest today in that heavenly sanctuary, the tabernacle pitched not with hands of man, but that was put together by God. Beloved, that is where we need to focus and put our eyes at this time. The Bible says, God will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed upon thee. Beloved, how can we have that perfect peace? How can we put our minds upon Christ if we're unaware of where he is at this time? unaware of what he is doing for us at this time. Beloved, when you understand the work and the position of Christ in the most holy place, then you understand the work and the purpose of the movement of God on this earth in this generation. Beloved, this is a wonderful truth we're talking about here. And I'm thankful that we were able to go through it. Now, I want to I close off with this point here. I want to close off. In the Great Controversy, page 488, in paragraph 3, we are told, The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns how many souls? Every soul living upon the earth. Does that include the children? Yes, beloved, go through this thing with your children. It says it opens to view the plan of redemption bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asketh him a reason of the hope that is in them. Beloved, I pray that we have gotten the answer. 
I pray that we are able to give the answer to those who ask us why we believe as we believe. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the wonderful truths that have been revealed to us today. Lord, I am tired, but I am so thankful that in Jesus, I can have rest. Lord, take me even now, cleanse me of my unrighteousness. I pray that you be with my brothers and my sisters from Shiloh Springfield Seven Adventist Church. Lord, as we're studying and as we're digging and as we're looking onto Jesus, reform us in your image. Be with us, we pray, and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.